This presentation is on subarachnoid hemorrhage. We are going to discuss spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage rather than traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, which remains the commonest cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage on imaging. The incidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage is approximately 7 per 100,000 per year in the UK. It is higher in other countries, such as Japan, where it approaches 20 per 100,000. The commonest cause is a ruptured intracranial aneurysm. There are other less common uh, vascular causes, however, 15% have no identifiable cause. There are modifiable risk factors for the development of intracranial aneurysms, including hypertension and smoking. Connective tissue disorders are also predisposing factors for the development of an intracranial aneurysm. The typical presentation of the subarachnoid hemorrhage is that of a thunderclap headache, reaching its maximum intensity within seconds. Patients often feel that they are about to die. Other clinical features of raised intracranial pressure can be present and are often dependent on the volume of intracranial hemorrhage. Meningism is often a subjective finding. Third nerve palsy can be due to an enlarging posterior communicating artery aneurysm. And hemiparesis and dysphagia and other focal neurological deficits can be present depending on the location and volume of hemorrhage. WFNS, World Federation of Neurological Surgeons grading system is based on the Glasgow Coma score and the presence or absence of focal neurological deficit. Uh, the increasing grade correlates with a worsening prognosis. Uh, there's a wide differential diagnosis for a thunderclap headache and as you can see in the slide um, the causes are very varied uh, from infective causes to tumours to other types of vascular disorders such as um, strokes, uh, venous sinus thrombosis and reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. Petruity apoplexy is an important differential and should be considered particularly when there's a visual disturbance or multiple oculomotor palsies noted. It should be noted that the minority of patients with a thunderclap headache actually have a subarachnoid hemorrhage but it is very important to exclude this diagnosis. Given the importance of making a diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage, many units have developed pathways to aid doctors in making the correct diagnosis. If the clinical history is suggestive of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a CT brain should be performed as soon as possible. If there's evidence of a subarachnoid hemorrhage in this scan, a CT angiogram should be performed and the patient referred to neurosurgery. If the CT is negative, um, a lumbar puncture should be considered. If the onset of the headache is within the past two weeks, a lumbar puncture should be performed. If this does not show any evidence of subarachnoid hemorrhage, an alternative diagnosis should be considered. If it confirms a subarachnoid hemorrhage, the patient should be referred to neurosurgery. If the result is inconclusive, um, and a subarachnoid hemorrhage cannot be excluded, the case needs discussed with neurosurgery. In a patient with a negative CT and a headache which initially started over two weeks ago, the case needs discussed with neurosurgery as the sensitivity of a lumbar puncture decreases with time. It is 70% sensitive at three weeks and 40% sensitive at four weeks. The volume of subarachnoid hemorrhage on CT is an indicator of the likelihood of developing symptomatic vasospasm. This has been quantified by the modified Fisher grading system. 25% of patients will have more than one aneurysm and the distribution of blood is very helpful in determining which aneurysm has bled to allow the ruptured aneurysm to be targeted and secured to prevent further hemorrhage. It is important that the lumbar puncture is performed correctly. Uh, bilirubin is the key on spectrophotometry. If it is present, it confirms the diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage. If a lumbar puncture is 
uh, performed incorrectly or if the sample is not analyzed in a timely and appropriate fashion, a large oxyhemoglobin peak could potentially mask any bilirubin, therefore rendering the test inconclusive. It's important the sample is sent to the lab quickly and spun down and protected from light as this can accelerate the breakdown of blood to form oxyhemoglobin. Bilirubin is only formed in vivo uh, from the breakdown of oxyhemoglobin and therefore will not be present on a traumatic tap. The initial management of patients with a subarachnoid hemorrhage follows the ABCD approach. Patients with a reduced conscious level may need intubated to protect their airway. Initial management includes bed rest, analgesia, antiemetics, and correction of INR if appropriate. Surges or falls in blood pressure should be avoided. Patients will often receive 125 mils per hour of normal saline. However, patients who have cardiac failure would be at risk of pulmonary edema with this and this can be modified in such circumstances. It is important to secure the aneurysm early to prevent re-bleeding. Endovascular coiling avoids the need for a craniotomy. It still carries a risk of stroke and there is a risk of late aneurysm recurrence which may require retreatment. Craniotomy and clipping also has a risk of stroke and can be a difficult operation with a swollen brain. Um, there are also risks of hemorrhage, uh, infection and seizures with uh, any craniotomy operation. Basospasm is a devastating complication in subarachnoid hemorrhage. It can peak up to one week after the bleed. Nemodipine is administered for 21 days after the ictus in all patients. This is given orally in a dose of 60 milligrams every four hours. If they develop symptomatic vasospasm despite this, Triple H therapy can be considered. The most important component of this is the hypertension, which is achieved using inotropes in an HDU or ICU setting. It is important that the aneurysm is secured prior to this. If this fails, intraarterial nemodipine can be considered. Other complications in subarachnoid hemorrhage include hyponatremia. Most frequently this is due to cerebral salt wasting and the treatment for this is sodium replacement. Occasionally it is due to SIADH. This is more difficult to manage as the treatment of choice is fluid restriction, but this can cause ischemic problems in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Hydrocephalus may require insertion of an external ventricular drain, or if it is non-obstructive, a lumbar puncture may be performed. If permanent CSF diversion is required, a ventriculoperitoneal shunt is indicated. Seizures and neurogenic pulmonary edema can occur also. ECG changes can occur with subarachnoid hemorrhage, as can troponin elevations. This can cause confusion in patients who have collapsed, uh, and often when they have a ECG change or troponin rise, they are felt to have a cardiac cause of their collapse and are given aspirin and taken to a cardiac cath lab where the actual diagnosis is a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage has a significant morbidity and mortality. It is important therefore to make the diagnosis properly and to instigate the appropriate treatment. An untreated aneurysm carries a significant risk of re-bleeding in the first two weeks. And patients who really bleed have a higher rate of death and disability. The non-aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhages have a very good prognosis and often make a full recovery.